Just a quick intro of myself for those of you who wandered in after we had already started. Um, again, my name is Ron Searchy. I've been a licensed massage therapist for 26 years now. I'm a Reiki teacher uh, for, I don't know, 18 years now. And I've also been teaching uh, for Drumvalel Melchizedek School, which is called the School of Remembering. Uh, we've been teaching. Um, what we call heart, co what heart math calls heart coherence, and it's the science of the heart. It's an ancient science, but it's, we have the technology today to prove what the ancients were talking about, and that's what we're gonna show you today. We feel like this is an extremely important at this particular junction of human consciousness, because, uh, well, well, you're gonna see within this talk. So without further ado, Josh, my dear friend is going to present the first half of the talk to you, and then I'll kick in for the end. So without further ado, Josh. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. So my name is Josh. And just a quick little history of myself. Um, it all started with me with crystals. And I got onto a Reiki table back in 2011. And once I got off the table, I was blown away. And I was like, where can I learn this? This is incredible. And it kind of all was on a very accelerated path. It was shortly after that that I met Ron and started uh, teaching the Awakening the Illuminated Heart workshop and talking about heart coherence and, and all of that. But to begin this talk, I want to go all the way back to my beginnings as uh, a dancer. It was really my love of music that began this whole journey. And that might seem like kind of a weird place to start. Like we're here to talk about heart coherence, science of the heart, and meditation. And here I am talking about music and my love of dance. How is that related? Well, as you're going to see throughout the course of this presentation, I believe that it was following my heart, my excitement, and my passions in life that led me here to this seat talking to you. So this is that internal compass that we have that we're all born with. It's that pull on our heartstrings that is going to lead us. In the, it's, like a, it's like the natural compass that you were born with is the feeling of excitement is the needle pointing north towards your life's path. And, I, and if we follow that, life opens up to us in a different way. So to kick this right off, we have a quote that says, in an age where technology has allowed us to expect instant reward and provides us with immediate solutions, humankind seems to have all the answers. Our confidence as a species is higher than ever before, and the knowledge of the universe we live in is expanding faster than most people can keep up with. There are, however, three fundamental questions that we've not been able to answer. Who are we, how did we get here, and why are we here? Taken from Michael Tellinger's Slave Species of God. Um, so I just want to briefly say this. This is a four-hour presentation that we're cramming into an hour. So it's going to go really quick. If you feel like you missed anything, just come find Ron and I. In the, in the other part of this building, and we'll just, we're just free to answer any questions that you might have. And so, considering ourselves to be the most advanced species to have ever walked the planet with all this information and technology right at our fingertips, we fail to answer these very basic questions about life. My question is, why? Why is that? It's a multi-layered question that requires a multi-layered answer, but we can begin to understand why we fail to remember these things by understanding cycles. We live in a universe of cycles within cycles. We're familiar with the cycles of the clock, day and night, cycles of the moon, the seasons, the solar system, a woman's menstrual cycle, and so on. Another cycle is something called the cycles of precession, where we have the Earth 
as the Earth is spinning on her axis. If you draw an invisible line through the Earth, she's tilted at approximately 23 degrees. And just like a top that's spinning, if you spin a top, as the top slows down, it begins to wobble. And the wobble is actually moving in the opposite direction of the spin. That wobble is referred to as the Chandler's wobble. And again, if you draw a line through the Earth and above and below the Earth, there will be an invisible circle drawn. That wobble takes approximately 26,000 years to go around one time. So why is this important? Why are we bringing this up? To answer that, we're going to talk about how our consciousness is connected to calendars and time. So our, our calendar, the Gregorian calendar, developed by Pope Gregory in 1582, is mostly a tool for control. It's based on the Earth's relationship to the sun. It really doesn't have much spiritual significance. We wake up, we go to work, we go to school, we pay our bills and our taxes and celebrate our holidays all by this calendar. So if we're talking about calendars, we're definitely going to talk about the Mayan civilization. Um, again, we consider ourselves to be the most advanced species to walk the planet. Yet here we have a civilization that existed more than 2,000 years ago that developed a more accurate calendar than we were able to with all of our technology. They have as many as 18 calendars, but four have been the focus of modern day researchers. The Zolkin, which means count of days, the tune or prophetic calendar. The Hob, which translates to earth. Hob was their, their um, calendar that basically tells them when to bring in the crops. Uh, and then they had their long count. And we can't go into this. I encourage you to do your own research on the subject. Um, we, Ron and I, had the opportunity to go and listen to Huns Botsman, who's pictured on, in both pictures on the left. Uh, he's a Mayan shaman who came to the Americas back in 2012, I believe it was, to do a series of ceremonies at certain sacred sites across the United States, inviting the public, public in to speak about what the Mayan prophecies are about. So this was the first time that the Mayans had spoken in a few hundred years about what everything, their whole, the, all the prophecies were about. And part of what they were telling us is that each calendar is like a cog in a machine, and they all turn together, and each, and each day on each cog is like a tooth in the gear, and they all turn, creating these cycles of time. And so the long count is approximately 5,000 years, and that would be that big one on the outside, and they're all turning together. And so with this, that side of things is considered the male measurement of time. And they all, the, the Mayans also knew that there is an axis to the entire universe. And they had a name for it and a symbol, and they called it the Hunub Ku. So this is also known as the galactic butterfly. This is the Mayan symbol for the central axis of the universe. Our, our science just discovered the axis of all that is around the turn of the 20th century. So we just discovered that there's an axis to the entire universe, not just our galaxy, but literally an axis to everything that exists. So you can see that the Mayans, their system of calendars was so deeply woven into the natural cycles of the universe that it held them a lot more closely connected to nature. And so they were so connected to their calendars that the day that a Mayan person was born was their name. So for example, if you were born on Monday, your name was Monday. And that, so that's how closely they were connected to their calendars. And so with this incredibly complex system of measuring time, what were the Mayans timing? Well, what was it all about? And after sitting with them directly and listening to them speak about this, clearly they were measuring and timing cycles of consciousness. They understood that half the cycle is light and half the cycle is dark. So I was just talking about the procession, 26,000 year cycle. The earth for 13,000 years is pointing away from the center of the galaxy. And then at a certain point, December 21st, 2012, and then on December 22nd, 2012, we're, we're beginning to point back towards the center of the galaxy. So when we're moving away, that's considered darkness. And when we begin be to move back towards, that's considered light. When we go into the dark, the male steps in to protect us. And when we go into the light, the female steps in to lead us into the light. It's even interesting that we almost saw a female president here in the United States. So we are blessed to be living during this amazing time in history when the, when the scales have shifted from 
dark to slightly more light than dark. It's a gradual process. It definitely takes some time. Um, we have thousands of years worth of prophecies from almost every indigenous culture around the globe saying that this is the time when people would awaken to their true potential. And so once we awaken, where do we find ourselves? We find ourselves on what Joseph Campbell called the hero's journey. And what Joseph did was he studied all the ancient myths and all the ancient religious texts to find this monomyth, this one story that was being told over and over and over again. No matter what ancient legends you were reading, there always seemed to be this same story that he called the hero's journey. And David Wilcock, I'm going to quote him a couple times throughout this presentation, had a great little definition for that. He, he explains, we're going through a prolonged evolutionary curve, and that curve could be described as a series of events that we have to go through that are called archetypes. Each of these events are necessary stages of evolution in order to become ascended and remember that we are the creator. That set of archetypes was called by Joseph Campbell the hero's journey. So we are all the hero of our own journey. We are going through this journey in our own lives, and even Hollywood is using this formula. They don't even like to refer to it as a formula. They're like, oh, we don't do that. But they really do because, we, and, th and this is why the best movies that do the best are all using this formula. Because deep within our genetic DNA, we feel this. It's encoded within our blood. We're living this, and that's why we connect to it in the movies. And so we're all on the hero's journey. We're all walking this path together, but we're all walking it individually at the same time. And nobody is ahead or behind or better than anybody else. We just have certain people that are curious, and we call them the explorers. And they ventured a little further down this road to return back and inform us of the road ahead. And these people, the explorers, they tell us that it takes a tremendous amount of courage to follow our hearts, but if we're willing to answer the call to adventure, embark on the hero's journey, and navigate the dark night of the soul, we will discover a bright light on the other end of the tunnel. When we wake up, we discover this network of beings. Everybody in this room at this conference is a part of that network. To me, you're all the light of the world. You really give me hope you know, that we can, I can wake up and go through another day because we're going to make it through this craziness. And so I know it sounds kind of cliche, but we really are the ones that we've been waiting for. We literally are the light at the end of the tunnel. So this light that we're generating, that we're emitting out to the world, is considered information. And darkness could be considered lack of information. And so it's been called the age of information, the age of awakening, the shift of the ages, the age of Aquarius. But we still seem to have all these sleepy people with their heads in the sand. And so, and so in spite of the fact that this is the, age, the shift of the ages that everybody's talking about, why, why do we have, we go out, we leave this conference, and we walk back into a world that seems to be mostly asleep? And in my humble opinion, I believe that's because we're in an information war. And this information war has a deep, profound effect on our belief patterns. There is a part of our mind with vastly greater capabilities than most of us are aware of. What we think we see may be nothing more than the product of a collective decision we're all making to see it that way, a form of mass hypnosis. And so at this point in the talk, we want to make a suggestion. Your beliefs literally shape your reality. When you look out your eyes, I want to suggest to see the reality in a different way. The image that you're seeing in front of your face, see it as a mirror, but not just any mirror, it's a holographic mirror. And every person, place, thing, and event that we experience in our life is a reflection of some aspect within our being. And so we can begin to use the reflection as a tool for self-healing and say, okay, what is this situation trying to tell me right now? What am I supposed to learn from this situation? There was a book written about this called The Holographic Universe by Michael Talbot. Again, we're shotgunning through a lot, a lot of this stuff, just you know, encouraging you to go and, and do some of the research on your own. So when we begin to see the universe as nothing but a mirror, and it's kind of a neat 
happenstance about the English language. You are quite literally the you in universe. You are all that exists. That's why it's called the you-niverse. And so all these amazing things that we're trying to point out to you to give you this grandiose, big picture perspective is hard to see from inside the box. 60 years ago, we were riding around on horses, and now we're landing on the moon, but it's hard to see how fast we're going from inside the system. So we need to pierce the veil and go beyond normal human consciousness, and when we do that, it becomes clear the sign of the times is upon us, a new paradigm is ahead. And so we're going to shift gears again. I want to talk about some of our, we talked about the Mayans. I want to talk about another indigenous group who survived the conquest of the Spanish. Um, the Spanish conquistadors came here more than 500 years ago and exterminated most of the indigenous populations of North and South America. Um, there were a few civilizations that managed to survive that, one of which were the Kogi. They retreated into the mountains of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta in Colombia, and they survived the conquest of the Spanish. And they've been living to this day the same way for the past, well, more than 500 years, but just since the, the Spanish came here 500 years ago. So without the wheel, without writing. And their spiritual leaders pictured on the left in the picture with the white hats on, they're called mamas. They're like the priests, the spiritual leaders of the tribe. And they're in, on the mountains um, you know what we have? We're a little bit ahead, so I am I'm actually going to play this video. Usually we were going to skip it, but I think we have some time. So I'm going to let the video do the talking. Hidden in the folds of a Colombian mountain are the secret cities of an ancient people. In 1989, they asked me to film their warning to the world. They said we needed their help. They warned of rising temperatures, melting snows, droughts, new diseases, increasing violence. This will happen, they said, because of the damage that we're doing to the Earth. We must stop doing it. They made their film, sent me away, and waited. And we did not stop doing it. We now have climate change, AIDS, endless wars steadily spreading. And now they've called me back. Time is running out. They failed to make us here. They have to do better. They're driven by fear of what they see will happen next. This time they're taking us into the places where life itself is born. We're being taken to Aluna, the mind inside nature. Their leaders are called mamas. Mama means the sun, enlightened. But first, from birth to adulthood, they're kept in the dark. They learn to work as hidden spirit midwives to all life, keeping it in balance. And we have overthrown that balance. So they're going on a journey to expose what happens where three worlds meet. Theirs, ours, and the inner world that is now being destroyed. They say it is us who live in the dark. 
it's not too late to avoid catastrophe if we open our eyes. There was another one called From the Heart of the World, An Elder Brother's Warning. That was the original one that they did. Uh, so I encourage you to go check that out. But just, just like these people are talking about, if we didn't change our ways, we're going to start to see all these earth changes, the rise of natural disasters, new diseases, terrorist events, and we're seeing that. Uh, we actually have half of all life. Science is confirmed. We're living during the sixth mass extinction. Half of all life that took billions of years to evolve on this planet has disappeared in the last 40 years. Um, something else that we're going to talk about here is we have the lowest recorded planetary magnetics in the past 2,000 years. We have an author, his name is Greg Braden. He's written a number of books. If anybody's familiar with him, it's fantastic uh, reading. Uh, definitely look into him. Was that within the changes that we are all feeling in our lives, as we look for reasons, say, what in the world is going on? You know, what's happening with the weather? Um, what's happening? It seems like everybody's going to war. Um, what's happening with my body? I don't sleep the way I used to, or uh, my relationships have gotten really intense. As different as those all seem from one another, they're all related. What we know is that uh, technically, and when I was a geologist, I could see this happening. Uh, the magnetic field of the Earth uh, is in decline. It has been for the last 2,000 years. It looks like the, uh, a chart on the, the New York Stock Exchange on a bad day. <laughs> uh, it's it started uh, declining. It's never gone back. Uh, so we're at the lowest point in planetary magnetics now that we have been uh, in, in the last 2,000 years. We have seen Earth have this experience in the geologic record. We've seen this happen at least 14 times in the last 4.5 million years. And every time it happens, it, it precedes a, a, a flip, a 180-degree reversal of the magnetic field. So they get weaker and weaker. The magnetic fields decline. They get weaker and weaker and weaker until they drop to zero for a, a period of a few days, it looks like. Uh, then the field reverses, and what used to be north pole is south. The south pole becomes north, and the fields begin to get stronger and stronger and stronger. The last time this happened uh, looked like it was around maybe nine, nine to 11,000 years ago. Uh, at that time, we saw the melting of the last ice age. A lot of uh, people believe Atlantis was here during that time. And as the ice melted, oceans rose, and that's why we don't see the continent of Atlantis anymore. Um, there's a whole program we could do on that. Uh, we know that those fields are declining. We know that that, uh, that is a fact. The scientists have believed that it's, it's linear, that you can know where it was 50 years ago and know where it is today and draw a straight line and say this is where it's going to be. Based on that, they say it's about another 2,000 years before we go into a, a zero uh, reversal. We know, however, that it is not linear. It's what's called a, uh, a geometric decline. And, the, and what that means is that as the field declines, it declines quickly. Um, Ancient calendars point to our time in history, the Mayan calendar, uh, the Egyptian calendar, uh, native oral traditions, uh, both in North South America and the Tibetan traditions. They all say that something is happening at, at our time in history, and this is when time as we know it uh, changes, uh, and that the, the Earth as we know it changes. So uh, scientists only within the last couple of years, the mainstream publications have now admitted. They say, yes, we are in the early stages of a, of a magnetic reversal. We don't know what that means. What we do know is that we're linked to those fields, our emotions, um, our sleep patterns, our perceptions of time and space, how we feel about our relationships, uh, our immune response. All those things are linked to the magnetic fields of the Earth, as well as the weather patterns. Uh, and this is something a lot of people aren't talking about. So the, the decrease of the magnetics is what is driving the weather patterns and the shifts that we're seeing right now, um, including global warming and, and, uh, and those kinds of things. So that was one parameter, the magnetics. The second was there's a, uh, the fundamental heartbeat of the Earth that the ancients talked about. Uh, the scientists first detected this in 1899. Um, it's measured a number of different ways, but the bottom line is we know that that fundamental heartbeat is speeding up. 
Uh, and we all know that because everyone says time is speeding up. Everyone, every country I've been to, people say it seems like time is speeding up. Why is that? Every cell in our body is uh, in resonance uh, trying to keep time with the heartbeat of our Mother Earth. And as that heartbeat increases, our cells uh, are trying to, uh, to metabolize uh, and maintain their existence uh, and match that increase. And we perceive that change as time speeding up. So to us, it feels like things are going faster because they are in, in that respect. Those two parameters together are physical parameters that can be measured uh, that tell us where we are at this time in history. And all I can say right now is, uh, is we've got very low magnetics and um, the pulse of the planet is twice, uh, twice what it was in the uh, mid-1980s. And, um, and we're not sure where that's going to go. The lowest planetary magnetics recorded in the last 2,000 years, they're going into the ice cores and they're pulling these ice cores out of the, um, the, the poles and, they're, and they are like a clock that we can go back and see how the cycles 652,000 years it goes back. And we can see that it's like a clock. The Earth will be like 90,000 years of pollen and then, or no pollen and then 10,000 years of pollen and then 90,000 years of ice and then 10,000 years of pollen and, then, and it just goes back like a clock. So, this is, so a lot of this, um, people will talk about how it's only human induced and I think that's only partially true. We're definitely having an impact on the environment, but there are natural cycles of the Earth that are, that are happening, that she's going through. And another thing that's happening is the Schumann resonance of the Earth. The natural resonant frequency of the Earth is double what it used to be in the 80s. So all the cells in our body are trying to keep time with the frequency of the Earth. And as she is raising her frequency, we're feeling that shift in our bodies. And we have a science here called the science of cymatics, and it's the study of the shape of sound. And so what they're doing is understand the voice that's coming out of my throat has a three-dimensional shape that's filling the room. And in the understanding of cymatics, they're able to take a metal plate and pour sand on the plate and vibrate the plate with an oscillator, and the sand will move into a shape. So remember, this is a 3D image that's being captured on a 2D surface. And they're just pouring more sand on the plate. And now see how, as the frequency gets higher, the shape gets more complex. And so what we want you to pay attention to is how there's periods of stress or chaos. Here's the stress, and then boom, it snaps into a new pattern, right? And they're just pouring more sand on there to get a clear image. But here, it goes into, um, so you'll see it'll distort, and then snap into a new pattern and then distort again, and then snap into a new pattern. And so why we're showing you this is because this is exactly what's happening on the planet. It gets like really, there's like no way for me to kill the... Um, this is exactly what's happening on the planet. We have to go through these periods of stress to get to the new pattern of peace. And as I said, as it gets higher, the shape gets more complex. So now let's go back and talk about the magnetics. I was t telling you that we've had the lowest recorded planetary magnetics in the past 2,000 years. Why is that important? Well, we have a story from the Mir space station about when they put the Russian cosmonauts on the Mir space station. They weren't the first people in space. They were the first people to spend the amount of time that they did on the station and after two weeks, the first guy that they put up there stopped responding. And they had to send a team up there, bring him back. And what they discovered was that he, was, he had lost all his memories and he was very ill and it was irreversible. And what they discovered is when you're outside the Earth's magnetic field, you, get, you lose your memories. It's a lot like a, magnet, a, like a cassette tape or a hard drive. It's held together, the, the memory is held together magnetically. So our memory is dependent upon the Earth's magnetic field to maintain itself and our health. And so since then they've developed d devices where they can simulate the Earth's magnetic field inside the station and go up there and be okay. And so we're gonna shift gears again and talk about something called the Magellan Effect. Uh, when Ferdinand Magellan sailed across the ocean and docked his ships in the harbor and they rowed in their little rowboats ashore, they met with a group of indigenous people and the indigenous people were like, how did you get here? 
And they were like, we came from our little boats from those big boats, and none of the indigenous people could see the big boats even though they were right in front of them, except for one of them who was a shaman, someone who was used to working with things outside of normal consciousness. So it was just too far outside of their frame of reference. They'd never seen anything like that before, and that's, your mind is so powerful that it will just erase it from your field of view. And this is actually a part of history. It was written down in Ferdinand Magellan's journal as part of his experience. And so we bring this up because it's still going on today. I myself have had experiences meditating with people, and I open my eyes and I see something, and I'm like, do you not see this? And the person sitting right next to me didn't see the, the things that I was seeing. I don't have time to go into the story now, but also Ron was trying to show me the phenomenon of, or of orbs. And at first, I just didn't see them. And then eventually, I started to see them in all my pictures, and I'm like, wow. And so there's a documentary called The or Orbs, The Veil is Lifting. And it's amazing. You know, we have people studying the photographs, saying it's not just lens flare or dust on a lens. They seem to respond to consciousness and good vibes. Uh, on the right, you're seeing an orb that they called in, um, Burning Man in the center, and then the one on the left was a daytime orb that they took a shot of. It was, uh, Ron had gotten that shot. And then also you can get videos. Uh, you could see, yeah. And so it's something to play with. You can go, and I don't really uh, have, usually we'll show you, like your ear only hears 20 to 20K, right? There are other frequencies that exist, but our ear is only designed to hear that, like dogs and cats can hear higher. Our eyes only see a bandwidth of light. So if you take a remote control for a TV, it has an infrared signal, and you push a button, but you don't see the infrared signal. But if you take your camera, and you were to put, put the TV remote up to the camera and push a button, you'll see the infrared signal. Usually we demonstrate this, but I don't have a, a TV remote here to demonstrate that. Basically what you do is you would get your TV remote and instead of pointing it to the TV, point it into your camera. And you'll, you'll see the signal. On your phone, you'll see the lights blinking in the front that your naked eyes can't see. So it's showing us technologies moving beyond. So we're picking up things that the naked eye isn't. Doesn't mean it's not here. Exactly. We have a phenomenon called crop circles. I'm going to play this. It's actually a clip from Thrive, but I'm going to kill the, the music and just talk about this one that's going to come up here. Um, the one crop circle that is eventually going to appear on the screen has over 400 circles. It was made during the middle of the night during a driving rain, leaving no footprints in the soil. And when it comes up, there's a helicopter too, and you could see the size, you can get like a feel for the size of this. And to know that, you know, here they're showing you the faked versions. And it's, it's pretty easy to see the difference between the faked ones, and then here's the one, here's the helicopter right here. You can get an idea for how big that is, 400 circles made during the middle of the night, during a driving rain, leaving no footprints in the soil. And this was, this is a clip from Thrive, what on earth, what on earth will it take? Free on YouTube, also on Gaia, which, perfect timing. There's a network called Gaia.com. It's like the spiritual Netflix. The who's who of spirituality and yes. Where is that called? I'm not sure where that one was found. It, most of them are in England, but I'm not sure about that one specifically. Um, there's a website called CropCircleConnector.org, I think. Type that into a Google search and they're a great um, reference for that. So Gaia.com, they're like a spiritual Netflix. And the number one show on Gaia is Cosmic Disclosure. We're actually lucky tonight at this conference to have Corey Good here with us tonight. So I'm not even going to really touch on this. I'm going to leave that for him. But they talk about the Antarctic Atlantis, deep underground bases. Um, we also have a gentleman by the name of Dr. Greer talking about UFOs. He's got Unacknowledged and Serious and the Disclosure Project, a bunch of high-ranking military officials that appeared before Congress to testify as to their experiences in the black, underground, unacknowledged government projects. Unacknowledged is on Netflix. And then just a couple of people that we handpicked that we felt were like the cream of the crop to talk about this subject. James Gilliland, he's got his ranch out on the west coast in Washington, and also Billy Meyer, who was taking pictures before Photoshop existed. 
pictures that were so good that you're seeing two of them there that they look fake. They look like models that the guy built. But when you watch the documentary, it's called The Silent Revolution of Truth. And you, you know, we're here, we're not here to, to, to tell you what's true. We're here to present all of this stuff and say, hey, go check it out and, and decide for yourself. And we're, we're ending this to talk about this, that pull in your heart, that what I was mentioning in the beginning is your discernment for you to say, oh, does that feel true to you? I'm not, I'm not here to tell you what's true. You're, we're trying to show you that you have this built-in compass that always knows what's true. And then we also have Edward Rupal, who headed, he was heading the investigation into Project Blue Book, also known as Project Grudge, back in the late or early 40s. And it's as simple as just getting some night vision goggles and going out into your backyard and checking out the sky. Because at the end of the day, we could talk about it all day long, but we should be getting outside and doing these things. Folks, literally, go get yourself some night vision goggles. You want to see a UFO, go outside and look up at the sky, turn off the TV, and there's a whole world going on. It's right there before our eyes, but we're being blanketed of the truth. But we have the technology today to go through the veil and, and have a tangible experience to yourself and not wait for someone like us or the TV to tell you what's true. Find out. And so what we were talking about the... Earth raising her frequency, allowing new levels of beings to come in here. They're, they're referred to as the indigos, the crystal children. Um, China has been documenting this for a while. There's a book out called China Super Psychics. There's probably a lot of books out, but we're just kind of bringing your attention to this one, um, where they're documenting these kids doing amazing things, walking through walls, floating objects around a room. And we have a video that I guess we're going to skip, where usually... It's like, it's like, all right, here we go. I believe the children <laughs> Sorry, are our in. future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. By all appearances, these children are just like any other kids. But in one way, they are like no other children you've ever met. To make it easier, let the children's laughter. Yeah, we can read blindfolded. Yes, we can. We can. Sunny and Lucy are just two of the students who attend this special class in England and can now demonstrate remarkable abilities. I traveled to Essex, home to the United Kingdom's oldest recorded town, to a seemingly ordinary suburban neighborhood where Nicola Farmer teaches children to play games. Where's the green? Point to the green for me. Good girl, well done. Read books. Harry, can you read me a sentence from your book? Aliens love underpants. Fabulous. And write, all while blindfolded. The ideal age to learn is between 5 and 12. Nicola says after 12, the left side of the brain, both critical and logical, interferes with the spiritual lessons. Nicola brought out these, mindfolds as they're called. Completely sealed from every angle, they are impossible to peek through. So I'm going to try this one on. Oh yeah, I can't see anything. Oh, that just shuts it all it's out. Just the foam. Actually suits you, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write something on this paper, and you'll tell me what I wrote, right? Okay, here we go. It's going to be one word. Light. Light. <laughs> that was so fast. <laughs> can I write yes, you can. Actually, can I draw something and then you redraw it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you can tell what this is. Car. What? I didn't even point it at you yet. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. It was a Mercedes. Oh, yay! Mm, the best at drawing cars. Number. You're better than me. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> now you just need the windows. That's so cool. Okay. That's on YouTube. You can check that out. And we're going to show another video here of a guy by the name of Master Joe who's also doing things at the level of Jesus. Thank you. 
Master Joe says the benefits of Qi Gong go beyond generating heat on command. He can also adjust his energy so that his body weight is shifted from his legs to his chest. He demonstrates this by stepping onto single sheets of paper stretched over box frames. To make sure the paper is as thin as it looks, we choose one at random and test it ourselves. Hold on to it. Yeah, hold on to me. I thought I had it. <laughs> as soon as I gave it any weight, the thing just totally snapped. Now, Master Joe steps forward. He climbs onto the first sheet of paper. He slowly works his way onto the second sheet. It gives under his weight, but still doesn't tear. And then the third, making it all the way across without breaking through. Master Joe explains he can make himself lighter by controlling and focusing his energy. As for those who remain skeptical about his power to heal, Master Joe simply says that after treatment, everybody believes. So example after example, what are we doing here? We're showing you things that are, it's quite obvious we are not in a normal ball game anymore. We're doing things today we have never done before. For instance, we're eating world foods. We've never eaten world foods before. A hundred years ago, uh, you know, today I can step out. I live in Center City, Philly. I can, I can step out my door. I can go in any direction. I can eat foods from the world. That's pretty incredible. I can get on the internet and I can get world information. And as Josh had mentioned earlier, we don't realize how rapid we are moving in this whole process of evolution because we are inside that box. But if you were to step outside the box, you could see quite clearly there's something incredible happening here. And if you just take the story of the children and what's going on there, and then you just, the story of the crop circles, and by the way, you can, you can scientifically prove a real crop circle from a fake one, because the fake ones, they die, they were stamped down, they broke the stalk on those crops. But the real crops still bloom. And you know, again, go to Crop Circle Connector, you can get really in depth with the science that's going on there. But from our perspective, Great Spirit is showing us example after example of incredible things that are going on right now that's, hey, we, we are no longer in a normal ballgame anymore. And in fact, the way that we like to say is that we are moving from checkers consciousness to chess. And in fact, really, I believe 3D chess is that we're playing now. Could you imagine living in a time when we thought the planet was flat? We were confined within the king's walls, and we weren't allowed to go a certain distance without being told that we were going to drop off the planet. Could you imagine living at the time when we realized, and the science, just like the science is doing again for us today, the science was proving to us, and Copernicus came along, and um, Plato came along with the science and proved to us that we are actually on a spherical planet. And how do you think life reacted to that then? Because we're going to do that again right now tenfold. We're about to wake up rapidly and we're going to drop and put into the trash can all the rules and regulations that have been put upon us. And it's very exciting. This is called the information age, right? We ever hear that? We're in the information age. We're in the information. We are. We are in the information age, but we must use discernment from our heart. And we're going to get into that a little bit deeper in a few minutes with the science of what we're talking about. But like Josh was saying earlier, we have to be able to feel what's going on because logically, we can't use our head right now. It's so distorted out there. I mean, you can't tell anymore if it's up or down, left or right. And one minute you can do this, the next minute you can't. You know, it's like one minute they're telling you, oh, this is good for you. The next minute they're like, oh, this is not good for you. You know, so we really need to grab a hold of ourselves, look in the mirror and say, hey, I'm the guru, right? That's what it says. So like, G-U-R-U, guru. I'm the guru. Right? And that's the case. We, we all have, we're all amazing beings here. And in fact, we are the seed that contains the whole of the universe. The big thing here that needs to be understood is something called perception. Okay? So let's just say that all of us right now, 
uh, saw something together. Uh, I don't want to use the word accident, but let's say we saw something together. All of us would have our own perspective and perception about what just took place, right? I think we can all agree to that. So perception is everything, really, when, it's, when we're talking about a holographic universe and painting the reality and using our minds to, to create the reality. If you're being told certain things, then you're going to project that out there and you're gonna, we're going, we are going to co-create these things together. So perception is everything. And, um, but right now, the perception is breaking down rapidly of what we've been told. And example after example, not just what we just showed you with the crop circles and the kids and UFOs and these kinds of things, but on a scientific level, um, we're seeing a lot of things that uh, is much different than what we were shown from when we were kids. So when we were kids in, in science, we opened up our textbook and we talked about the planetary bodies on a two-dimensional surface going around the sun, which is true, that is true. But that's not quite what's going on. What's really happening is that we're actually corkscrewing through the universe together. And in fact, every system is corkscrewing, not just ours. So that's pretty incredible within itself to think about that. And also what um, is being shown here on the screen is that the sun is dipping up and below the cosmic plane. Remember, Josh mentioned 13,000 years we go into the light, 13,000 years we fall asleep, 13,000 years we wake up, 13,000 years we fall asleep. There's, they're all cycles. They're all cycles within cycles within cycles. And by the way, I just want to mention that we are in the rinse cycle, thank goodness, right now. So, and so moving forward, perception is, is, is key. And one other thing they didn't show you there, just a little side note, that our system is moving through space like a DNA helical pattern with star system Sirius. Well, the Dogon tribe in Africa actually knew about all that, and it's all written down in their caves, those silly um, third world, world cultured beings. And, you know, so, so when science finally got to them and saw what they were showing in their caves, they were like, how did you know this? And that story within itself is pretty incredible. I highly recommend. Um, it's called The um, Serious Mystery. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Can't think of the author in my head at the moment. So we're going to move forward here. There's another incredible group of people we must mention if we're talking about perception. And this is the Electric Universe Symposium. In 2004, there was a group of 30 to 40 of the top physicists that came together. And in 2014, they went public with their findings. And some of their findings are so incredible, they're just rocking science. And uh, so if you're a scientist, you need to be looking into this work. And some of the findings that they discovered is uh, one of the big things that we liked to talk about was the Birkeland currents. Now, we all are familiar with that there are three different types of electricity, okay? There's electricity that we all find in our walls, right? There's another form of electricity that we're just coming into that's ancient, and that's known as chi, prana, ether, tachyon, ka, spirit, universal life force, okay? And then there's this third form of electricity, which is called the Birkeland currents. And the way that the Electric Universe Symposium group talked about these currents is very fascinating. They can see that coming out of the North Pole of the Sun, these currents are ejected out and they're moving in zero time. That's pretty incredible. So let me repeat that. So the science is finding that out of the Sun, there comes these DNA helical pattern currents that you're looking at on the screen there and they're moving so fast that they're moving in zero time which means that we are no longer in the speed limit in the universe of light, right? Light is no longer the fastest thing in the universe. It's actually an eight-track tape at this moment. So if you hear somebody who's sounding all astute and they want to make a point and they're at dinner with their three glasses of wine and they're talking about it takes six light years to go here and four light years to go there, you could just tell that to put that in a trash can because it's like listening to an eight-track tape. In fact, what's going on is that the um, EU people are saying that the Birkeland currents make the speed of light look like a snail. Okay, so that's going to change everything. Telecommunications, travel, think about it. Okay, so we're moving forward. Um, and the other thing that 
in this particular finding about the Birkeland currents is that they can prove that electricity is governing the entire universe. And my mother, I was talking about her earlier when we did the meditation, she was, grew, came in the hippie era, and they used to walk around saying that we're all one. Well, science can prove that right now because when they see the Birkeland currents in motion out of the sun, they can see it hit plankton, micro levels, and Pluto, macro levels of space and time instantaneously. So that's how they know that it's moving in zero time. So we are in a new ball game. Another thing that they brought up I thought was very fascinating, and really, if you want to, uh, let me just back this up real quick for those of you. If you want to investigate these guys, it's called the Thunderbolts Project on YouTube. And they're constantly giving updates and they're constantly shattering our old sciences, which is a lot of fun. But one of the things that I thought was really cool was when they brought this out, what they began to discover, they would see in space that there was these electrical discharges coming off the various planetary bodies in space. And what they discovered is that it was these electrical discharges that was in fact creating the craters that we see all over the planetary bodies. And if you just look closely here, if you look at the ridge of this crater, you see what looks like a hexagon, correct? So how is it that an asteroid is coming in and slamming in and creating these geometric ridges? And some of them actually have like a little nipple or a, a divot in the center of the crater. And the other thing is, why isn't there scarring all over the surface of the planet? Why isn't, if, there's, if it was meters, meteors creating these creators, how is it that there's not scarring from the meters, the meteor coming in and scraping across? It's almost as if every single impact was aimed directly at the center of the moon. There's no evidence of any side swiping. Yeah, well, I'm just saying it was where you look. Every single impact is angled towards the center of the moon. There's a startling absence of evidence of side swiping and, and again, like I said, you can see like right here in the c center, you see these little nipples or convex and concave divots in the centers of a lot of them. So how is a meteor coming in making a crater within a crater? You know what I mean? It's like a fractal, okay? Uh, we're very gullible as a human species and if somebody says that they're a specialist and they're scientists and we just, you know, all bow down to what they're saying, you know, that's just kind of what the common norm has been for a long time. We like to call NASA never a straight answer, so just to, you know. <clears throat> so we're going to take a little quote here from Carl Sagan. He once said that the nitrogen in our DNA and the calcium that's in our teeth and the iron that's in our blood and the carbon that's in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. And in fact, we are made from star stuff, okay? So if we're made from star stuff, wouldn't you think then we are electrical? We're electrical beings, right? Well, if you want to simplify that, just let's look at an atom. Well, what does an atom comprise of? Well, you have the neutron in the middle, and you have a proton moving around a what? An electron. That's right, everyone. That's the way to jump in there. You have a proton moving around an electron which you clearly see right there in that word, electron. So the fabrication of the reality is made up a portion of electricity. It's all right there before our eyes. Another thing I like to just throw in here real quick is that we're also taught that this is 3D, right? Everything's in threes here. You got the father, mother, child. You got left, right, middle, hot, warm, cold, the sun, the moon, the earth, past, present, future, proton, electron, neutron, up, down, middle, white, black, gray, yay, yay, yay. You get the gist, right? So in health, what we're always told, it's mind, body, and spirit. So what is spirit? Going to church for an hour? Is that spirit? I mean, you can't be, you know, so mental and be like a, a triathlete and be completely disconnected. You have to be spiritually connected. And so what does that really mean, to be spiritually connected? Well, let me just switch gears into this gentleman. Everyone here familiar with this guy's work? Alex Gray. Well, I'm sure you're familiar with the last name, Gray, like in Gray Anatomy. Well, we've been blessed to spend some time with Alex and uh, pick his brain a little bit and uh, see what makes him tick. And uh, also, we've been 
up at his facility uh, leading workshops and whatnot, meditations. It's just a lot of fun to go and hang out with him. But what I find fascinating about Alex Gray is that if you open up Harvard Medical Books, you will find his work there. And what you will find is that he's drawing you the anatomy, correct? This isn't a no-brainer, right? This isn't rocket science. We see all that. He's drawing the different levels of the physical body. What you have here, the lymphatics, the muscles, etc., and the different skin types. But he also draws something else that is not found in Harvard Medical Books, which he says he can see, is your electrical body. So when you talk about mind, body, and spirit, well, guess what, folks? You literally have an electrical anatomy that we can see today. It's found in the microwave range. At four, it's found at the microwave range at four degrees Kelvin, which is four degrees above absolute zero. So we actually have the instruments to see your electrical body. So you're not just mind, body, but you're also spirit too. And just like your physical body, it needs nourishment from the elements of the earth, right? We talked about this briefly a little earlier. You need the minerals from the earth, which we're having a problem with because we have a soil problem. So we're malnutritioned. We're not getting the proper nutrition that we should be getting. So we're, so we're malnutrition from the minerals from the earth. We were ingesting plastic and bottled water and all this kind of other stuff. We could talk about water for hours and Dr. Emoto's incredible work and a, f a great piece called The Secrets of Water on Gaia, which I highly recommend. So the minerals, the water, the air, right? We're polluting the air. You need the air. Air brings pollination, oxygen, et cetera. And then you got fire and light, you know, so you got the four elements. But there's a fifth, fifth element. Anyone know what the fifth element is? That's right, it's chi, prana, ether, tachyon, spirit, universal life force, mana, ka. Uh, there's many terms for this fifth element found all over the planet. And that fifth element is found within all the four other elements. So it's the most sacred of all elements. It's actually so sacred that in the schools of Plato, they would not let you speak about it outside the school. They would kill you on the spot, is what our textbooks say, if you spoke about the ethers. Okay, outside of Plato's schools. So how do we nourish the electrical body with this fifth element, prana? Well, that's simple. You have modalities today like qigong, right? Or tai chi. Well, what are these people doing? They're, they're, it's a dance. It's a motion that they're doing. I love qigong with specific understandings of the electrical body and specific breath that they're actually harnessing and grabbing the qi from, that is everywhere, and bringing it in, harnessing it into the electrical body. That's what's going on. You're nourishing your electrical body, okay? And it's not just the chakras and the meridians. There's many layers to the electrical body that we can see, many layers. Just like the physical body has many layers, so does the electrical body, okay? So it's very important to understand this. This is the key. This is what's missing in our society right now, is all this stuff is this understanding of the electrical body and that fifth element called prana, chi, ether. When you go to yoga, they're teaching you pranayana yogic breathing, right? Prana breathing, hear it in there? Pranayana yogic breathing, prana breathing. You should be being taught prana breathing. I don't think a lot of people are teaching that properly in yoga class, but that's the whole sense. And yoga is a vast science, a very vast science. And again, so you have things like Reiki, which is you know, using your hands as a tuning fork. It hasn't had nothing to do with the practitioner, and it has nothing to do with the client on the table. It has to do with the practitioner's hands that act as a tuning fork for the Reiki energy, right? With the energy that's everywhere at once. So again, these are modalities that we are directly tapping into the ether, the fifth element, to draw it into us and to nourish the electrical body. It's very important. So moving forward. This image, most of us should know at this point, this image is known as the flower of life, okay? And, and this image literally is the blueprint of, of the reality, okay? And we can prove that. And, and this, is what the, this is how the Egyptians taught it. I'll just show you real quick. Just pretend all of us are in a pitch dark room. Not one inkling of light is in here. So we all have the ability to see, sense, psychically, to see, sense, and feel so far in front of us, to our sides, behind us, 
above us and below us, right? Can we all kind of agree to that? If we all were in a pitch dark room, we all would have the ability to feel so far around us, okay? So if you took those lines, front, back, left, right, up, down, and you connected those lines <coughs> with more straight lines, you would create literally a diamond, okay? If you can envision that. Now, we're great spirit. We're in a void of nothingness. There's there's no reference to anything. There's nothing. It's just the void and you, great spirit, with this ability, psychic ability, to project these lines around you. And you connect those lines, you create a diamond, and then what happens is you spin that diamond on the, on the three axis points. And what happens, you're spinning this way, you're spinning that way, you create a bubble. So now great spirit is in the void and he just created a bubble around himself. So now great spirit can move upon the face of the waters anywhere on that bubble and repeat the process and create another bubble. And what happens is great spirit begin, starts with the single bubble, goes up, creates a second bubble, and goes a vortex, and just starts to vortex around. And vortex and vortexing around. And this is how this image came to be, and this is how the Egyptians taught it. It's not the only way, but it's how the Egyptians taught it. There is a gentleman who we must talk about, if you're gonna talk about that image, and that's Drumvalo Melchizedek. He's our main teacher. In my point of view, Drumvalo is literally the metaphysical godfather of this time. He went around and turned over all the big rocks in the 80s and 90s so that the Greg Bradens and the Nassim Harrimans and all of them could follow suit. Greg Braden was one of Drumvalo's original students. Greg actually used to live in Drumvalo's house. So a lot of the work that Greg is doing is from the, from the help of the understanding of what Drew had passed on in the early stages. This Drumvalo went public in 84, teaching about all this stuff, and in 1999, he came out with the Ancient Secrets of the Flower of Life book. I'm sure... Many of you out there are familiar with this book. It's a classic at this, at this point. Um, and one of the things that Drew did in the early stages is he went around the planet and he noticed that all over the planet they found this flower of life image. And it was always cut off. If you can see, like right here, it's always cut off to the flower portion. It's in different stages. There's the seed, the flower, and then the fruit, which I'll show you real quick. But when he went around the world, he discovered that it was always cut off here and, and here on this wall is a, a, a wall that was dated 6,000 years old. They found this, the flower of life image, like burned into the rock 6,000 years ago. And then you see here Leonardo da Vinci, he was drawing it too. And really, if you understand this image, what happens is that it pops out something called sacred geometry. So here you can see the first stage, which is the seed, the seed image here, this first level, creates a, a ge geometric fi uh, image, which is known as the tube torus. Don't have it here with me at the moment, um, but we're going to get into that in a second. So just keep that in mind that the seed of life creates the, the tube torus. The next stage would be the, the flower of life, which we just saw in the previous picture, and then after the flower comes the fruit. When you get to this stage, there's something miraculous that happens, and you see all these darkened circles. If you if you connect the centers to all these darkened circles, you get what is known as Metatron's cube, which we have hanging here behind Josh. So the fruit of life is female in nature, right? You're looking at circles. It's all female energy. And out of that female energy comes the male energy. So you're seeing a system that is birthed of female energy that brings the male energy. It's very important to understand that too. And so what? Why are we showing you all this stuff? Because if you see in the Metatron's cube on the end there, what pops out is the five platonic solids. Well, if you understand the five platonic solids, they are the building blocks of the reality. I don't care if you're talking about chemistry or if you're talking about engineering. You have to understand this stuff. But when you go into the textbooks and ask, where does this stuff come from? Nobody ever tells you. It just arbitrarily pops out of nowhere. It's a magical. Here's the five platonic solids. Well, what it comes from is this system, everybody, okay? It comes from the flower of life system, all right? So it's good to understand this stuff for the left brain. So the left brain needs to logically understand this stuff because down the road it makes uh, meditation and understanding the human body a lot easier. Uh, again, you're going to see these images throughout nature uh, in crystals, fungus, beehives. You're going you're to see them on a, on a macro level. If you see the North Pole of the Saturn, you clearly see the hexagon geometry, you see it molecules, everyone's familiar with Dr. Emoto's work at this point, you better be, uh, and viruses of course, that too, and then another little small example is this little book, 
uh, of coincidences by John Martineau. And what you're looking at here, this pattern here, is I believe, what, five years, Josh? It's the dance of Earth and Venus mapped over, mapped over eight years. Earth, Earth and Venus traced over eight years. So there we're seeing on even large levels that there's this divine mathematical blueprint. And it's incredible. And by the way, we like to say in our world that God equals geometry of divinity. Okay. So moving forward, why are we showing you the geometries? What's the point? Because the point is you are made up of this geometry, literally. So as you can see here, as you start off as a sphere and you divide, as, and Josh is holding a buckyball, by the way. Then we start off as a sphere, right? It's funny. We start off in a female geometric ge geometry, and then from in binary sequence, mitosis. If I can kind of remember my biology a little bit, we divide from one sphere into two, right? But something happens real quick when we divide the two. We get this ge geometric image, which is called the Ves Vesca Pisces, which is also an incredible image to understand, which is the shape of your eye. You, without without great spirit going into the second image. Uh, light could not have come here because it's that image which receives the light, okay? So we go from two to four binary sequence, but our textbooks, if you see what Josh is holding, our textbooks show it like this, two-dimensionally. And that's not what happens at all, actually. When you divide from two cells to four cells, this is happening in nanoseconds, right? It's happening really quick. You actually go into this pattern, which is known as the tetrahedron. So that's literally what happens when you divide from two cells to four cells. You literally go into this shape, which is a tetrahedron, okay? And you can see, and they have the ability now, because they have got le electron microscopes, and they can videotape this process and slow it down and watch it, okay? And then when you go from f four cells to eight cells, binary sequence, we turn into a star tetrahedron, right? Two-dimensionally, what's the star tetrahedron? The star of David. Where do you think that came from? All right. So, and then as you see here, this picture on the right-hand side, you can clearly see that star tetrahedron. And that's why um, oftentimes in meditation practices, they refer back to that star tetrahedron, right? How many times we have seen that image in our textbooks and stuff? Well, all that stuff has to be generated from something, and we're showing you what it's, where it's coming from, so that the logical brain can then say, okay, I understand that now, let's move forward with this. All right, this also, I just wanna let you know that this particular stage is known as the egg of life, and I went to a conference with Deepak Chopra many years ago, he wrote a book and talked about how every five to seven years, our entire body regenerates cell-wise, except for those eight cells, they're still within your body, they're immortal to you, and in meditative practices, you can actually go in and connect to those eight cells and reboot them if you're having issues in the body. That's just a side note to know. Again, we're taking a four-day workshop and cramming it in down your throat in an hour. I hope you're able to consume some of this. So, Is that why the scalar energy works? Yes, absolutely. Yep. That's, and we're, and that's, you're going to see a lot more of that, too, right now. Uh, real fast, Leonardo da Vinci, you know, in school we were never told why these lines were here. What's that line and what's this line and what are these lines and what are that lines? We just, you know, the, the health industry just grabbed this thing and said, this is ours. This is our health image, you know. And what really Leonardo is doing is showing you the proportions of what is known as the Fibonacci sequence. Just a little side note how we keep saying that your body is the measuring stick to the universe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you took the the ratio of this sphere, which is known as the Leonardo sphere, or AKA the alpha sphere, and you drew a little sphere in here. Which would be the diameter from your wrist to your, like this, mm -hmm. and then drew a sphere like that. So you take the sphere that's around your body, and then that, and then do what you just did, one hand length above the head, and drew a sphere here. They would be the exact proportions of the earth and the moon, literally. So that's why, I mean, it just goes on and on. If you look at that book of John Martineau, he really breaks that all down. It is quite unbelievable, really, how well we are all intimately connected. So moving forward, there is a, there's something known in our textbooks and in the world is known as the golden mean spiral. The golden mean spiral is great spirits um, geometry, so to say. And what the issue is that life 
doesn't know how to do this perfect spiral. So life found a way to cheat, so to say, and it found, or found a way to rapidly approximate this spiral. Thank you. And so what we're seeing here is that life is using its own ratio, which is known as the Fibonacci sequence. I highly recommend you go and check out the movie Inner Worlds, Outer Worlds. It's about an hour long. It's on Gaia, yeah. Everything's on Gaia these days, by the way. Not just Corey, but everything. <laughs> Gaia. So if you go to Gaia, it's called yeah, G A I A dot com, and it's called Inner Worlds, Outer Worlds. It's a fantastic film on sacred geometry. We are going to jump into this topic. This is something called Merkaba. Uh, Merkaba is a vast science. Mer is a counter-rotating field of Ka and Ba. The Earth is an exact replica of a human being, or you could look at it the other way around. The human being is an exact replica of the Earth. We don't look like it. We're not round, and we look different. But our energy field, uh, the, the human light body that extends around the, the human being, that light body, that the electromagnetic field and the shape of the field that's inside of that body, which is around a person, it's about 55 to 60 feet in diameter, and it's a perfect sphere, but inside is this very complex uh, electromagnetic field. That energy field is identical to what's around the Earth. And NASA has slowly been a able to identify all the various components in there. Uh, they agree at this point. I, I believe they do. As above, so below, we are mimicking the larger system. Okay, so we know we have these fields around the Earth and we got these fields around the body. We're going to move really quick here, the last two minutes or so of this talk. Something else that Drew brought out to us is called the, uh, the psychic bars. If you're somebody who is um, looking to enhance or understand the pineal and the third eye, go to YouTube, type in Drumvalel Melchizedek psychic bars. He'll explain this whole process on YouTube for you. It's fascinating. He was taught by the kahunas from Hawaii and the Mayans. They explained all, all the intricacies of the third eye. The book on the right, Living in the Heart, is one of five books in the world that are talking about the science of the heart, which is where we're going. There's a department out of Stanford University called HeartMath. Most of us here are familiar with HeartMath. What HeartMath discovered is that every time the heart is beating, right now, as we're all sitting in this room together and the heart is beating, we have a biomagnetic field coming off the body that's 5,000 times stronger than any mental field. This field that you're seeing on the screen now, they used to say it went to 8 to 10 feet. Now they can see it measures out 55 feet. So you have a biomagnetic field coming off the heart that's 5,000 times stronger than the fields coming off the mind. What are we wasting our time in our head for? Futurist Dwayne Elgin explains how the torus is the primary pattern that nature uses for life at every scale. Evolution means to, uh, to unfold, to roll out. So the question is, what is the universe rolling out? And what the universe is rolling out is self-organizing systems. And you can see this at every scale. A self-organizing system is a technical term for just uh, a system getting a hold of itself, uh, knowing itself, essentially. And uh, if we go to nature, uh, we, can, we can look at and we can see the self-organizing forms uh, throughout. We can see it. In, in the cross-section of an orange, the cross-section uh, of an apple. We can see it uh, in the dynamic nature of a tornado. Uh, we can see it in the um, magnetic field around the Earth, a similar magnetic field around a, uh, an individual. We can see it in the structure of an entire whirlpool galaxy. Uh, we can see it in the structure uh, of, a, of a small atom. Uh, at every scale throughout its entire history, the universe has one single project. It's growing toruses. The universe is a torus growing factory. So, so we're living in a torus. And I would, I would recommend going and watch that film called Thrive. If anyone hasn't seen it, it's a fantastic film. If we're going to talk about toruses, we're bringing up this guy's work, Marco Rodin. He took the Enneagram on the left-hand side there, an ancient uh, diagram, and he mixed it with the, uh, with the, with the torus and created a new math called Vortex Mathematics. If you're a mathematician in here, you've got to go check out this guy's work. He's going to change math. 
another thing we talked earlier about the connection to Mother Earth and Father Sky. I also just want to put a little emphasis that the longest journey in one's life is the 18 inches from their head to their heart. Okay, so just remember that. There's something known as earthing today. Are we familiar with earthing? If you're not, please check into this work because we need to make that connection back to Mother Earth. We lost that connection to her. Okay, and, and we got to remember that connection to Father Sky. And then the last thing we're just going to say here is that there's science found that there's two different ways to create. You can literally create with your head, which we all know came out of the secret, but there's a problem with that that they didn't tell us in that book. And the problem is when you use your mind to create something, you're going to get what you want to create, but you're going to get the opposite because it's a dualistic tool. Okay, that's the tool that it is. All right. And, but there's another way, uh, because the mind's polarized, right? But there's another way to, to create, and that's from the heart. Remember those fields coming off the heart, ladies and gentlemen? Well, we can actually utilize those fields. And, but we've, we, we've been dormant to this. Remember we talked about the Magellan effect and all that stuff earlier? Well, we've been dormant to that. Uh, and then these are just a few of the images of the last 16 years that Josh and I have been holding these workshops in the tri-state area. Getting, getting people in our four-day program to understand what it is to operate from your heart, okay? So with that said, thank you very much. If you have any questions, please find us. Uh, we got flyers here. If you'd like to give us your email, we can reach back out to you. Namaste, everyone. Have an incredible day.